little bit about uh, EOS and where we come from. Uh, our background is actually in 3D engineering and design. And over the last roughly 30 years, there's been quite a bit of software and, and engineering practice development around using 3D, not just for design, but also for analysis and even simulation of design. Uh, about roughly a decade ago, uh, some of my colleagues and I identified that, that this had in fact reached a critical mass in the engineering space, but there was very little effort being done beyond engineering looking at areas such as operations, for example, uh, maintenance, repair, overhaul, uh, supply chain, and even decommissioning work was, was largely being ignored by these 3D engineering practice and simulation methods. So we formed EOS and we, we specifically went after that market and along the way we found a number of applications we didn't expect, including safety. Uh, today, about 65% of our, we are based in uh, Detroit, the, uh, the Motor City, although we do almost nothing with the auto industry today, about 70% of our business is oil and gas, and the remainder is uh, aerospace and defense. We've partnered with uh, Norisol in Norway to address the, um, the North Sea uh, oil industry. We've done quite a bit of work uh, in the United States, both in uh, terrestrial fields as well as offshore in the Gulf. And now, uh, since 2010, we've or, yeah, since 2010, we've begun to uh, expand in the North Sea as well. So, what is it specifically that we do? So we've talked about simulators today, and simulators imply that there's an environment in which a person enters and they go through a, a role-playing exercise. There are drilling simulators, there are shipboard operation <coughs> simulators, driving simulators, uh, flight simulators. These are all where a person enters uh, a virtual environment and goes through a number of scenarios. What we do is a little bit different we actually do a simulation. So in this case, we take a system. It could be traffic flow within a city. It could be operations inside a factory. It could be operations on a ship or a platform. We decompose the, that system into a, a mathematical description. And then we actually build an analytical model from that that allows us to test plans, to evaluate procedures, and to, uh, to kind of gauge overall how, in fact, does that system function. So to do this, as I said, first we build a mathematical model. And when we're looking at a system, particularly a system that doesn't exist yet, uh, a ship that has yet to be built, for example, this becomes a bit of a tricky process. So what we actually do is we take the system and we break it down into its smallest element, perhaps a person, perhaps a piece of equipment, and then we define what, in fact, the role of that equipment is. What does it do? What are its goals? What are the rules that govern it? And by defining each of these individual elements, we in fact build up to the system. So instead of taking a top-down approach, looking at the entire thing and then trying to map the relationships between each element within the system, we go the other direction. We start with the elements in the system, define those, and then we allow them to run around and interact in a three-dimensional environment. So it's actually similar to, uh, to game theory, and very often people draw parallels between what we do and video games. And in fact, uh, it looks the same, but the, uh, I can assure you the video game people make much more money than we do. We then extrapolate that up into an analytical model, and it's that analytical model at the top that you see that allows us to actually study the results. We can make inferences, we can test theories, we can find sensitivity, uh, do design of experiments, and that allows us to build an environment in which our clients can test their plans, test their theories, and in fact prove out how, how will this system behave or how is this system behaving. Oops. Sorry. So an example from uh, the offshore oil industry, if you could start the video please. Okay, great. 
An example from the offshore oil industry. Uh, we were given uh, a project by one of our clients to look at the evacuation procedures that they had on a particular platform. So we started by laser scanning the platform, which is a process in which we come in and we actually uh, capture the 3D data that uh, describes the platform. After capturing the platform design, we then went in and we modeled the operations. So we looked at what, uh, what does each person on the platform do, uh, what, what, is, what do typical operations look like, and that allowed us to do evacuation scenarios starting with kind of a real, um, uh, a real entry position, if you will. We also modeled the equipment and then, of course, standard operating procedures. In addition to this, our model took into account seasons. Uh, we looked at weather patterns. So in fact, we could run scenarios at night. We could run them in inclement weather. Uh, we could run them in different sea states. And these all had an effect on the individual people within the model. Beyond that, we even got into learning curves and human behavior. So we developed uh, a human behavior algorithm within our model. Um, since this project, we've started uh, working with Trinity College Dublin, who've done extensive research on human behavior in crisis situations as well uh, to kind of enhance that model. But it, at the point that we deployed it for this customer, what we essentially had was the variation in human behavior from people who uh, intuitively know what to do, seem to follow procedure, go in the right direction when, when disaster occurs, versus those who do not. And so within the model, we've got some variability applied there as well. Uh, we can put things like visibility. Uh, so if we have a fire, for example, or if it occurs at night, how does the low visibility affect uh, the people involved? And then we can also add some random variability. So we can have catastrophes that occur in different locations, different types of catastrophes. And so by simulating, uh, liter by doing literally thousands of simulations with this model, we can build up an overall pattern of behavior. And we can begin to make inference. And from that, we can, in fact, begin to optimize. So we can look at where is the best place to put emergency equipment what is, in fact, uh, the optimum escape route for a given group of people. Or more importantly, if their primary escape route is blocked for whatever reason, what's the optimum plan B? And how robust is that plan B? Uh, how does one group's plan B affect another's plan B, or even worse, their plan C? And so forth and so on. And in this way, we can test the planning uh, not just once, but many, many times. And in a dynamic environment that takes you beyond, uh, let's say, damage control drills, for example, and, and can in fact be done offline in a controlled environment. One of the things that we find very often uh, within an operational group is that, in fact, and I'm sure this will come as a huge surprise to you, the personalities involved are quite strong and, and uh, matter. Using uh, scientific methods, simulation being one of them, you take the personalities out, and you get into a mathematical environment where you can deal in terms of these are the actual results. This is what the model says. We can argue about how the model was built. We can argue about the precision of the model. But in fact, we're talking about mathematics here. And so it, it takes opinion. It doesn't necessarily throw opinion out, but it puts opinion in the context of fact and something that can be measured. So for this particular client, uh, we did in fact rearrange a number of their procedures as well as their equipment. Uh, and it, what they saw was a significant increase, uh, not only in the results of the uh, positive results in simulation, but also in operation. When they would run their drills, they saw uh, significant improvement in their, um, in their overall efficiency. So now taking a step down and looking at the human being. So before we were looking at the system, we had a number of people on the platform, and we were really analyzing the interaction between those people and the equipment. Now we're going to go one level deeper, and we're actually going to look at uh, the effects on a single person's body. To do that, uh, we use a, a special software suite um, that's commercially available from Dassault System that has a completely, uh, fully articulated human model in it. Uh, this, this human model is not unlike an engineering model of a system. We have uh, all of the joints modeled. In fact, I believe there's 120 different joints 
uh, mode within this, uh, this human mannequin. And we can look at the effects on the body in a mathematical way, uh, just as they would affect a person in the real world. To that end, we can do things like uh, reach analysis, for example. Can a person reach, reach up to a valve? Um, we can look at repetitive trauma. So if I do this task over and over again every day, what's the uh, effect of that repetitive trauma, not just on that person today, but 20 years from now. If they've done that, that task over a two year period, 20 years from now, how do we expect that person to age? And what are some of the life cycle uh, issues that we expect that person to see? And then we can also even go into uh, workload and activity balancing, looking at things like fatigue. Uh, not just physical fatigue, but mental fatigue as well. So what, how does cognitive ability begin to break down over time, and what effect does that have on the ability for people to do work? Uh, unfortunately, I have to apologize. This, this video is not playing for us today. Otherwise, you would see the most fascinating video ever made of men getting out of a truck. <laughs> The, uh, it's, it was rather shocking to me the first time I heard this, but in fact, the single largest, uh, or I, I guess the single highest uh, driver of casualties in the uh, Iraq and Afghanistan wars in the United States was in fact back injuries. Uh, it's, it's not actually combat related, but it's, it's uh, physical just back injuries. And the, um, the life cycle cost for those, injury, in, uh, those back injuries is expected to be quite high in the United States. After going through and analyzing the effects, or I guess the, uh, the risks to uh, soldiers in a variety of different ways, the military uh, began to zero in on dismounting from vehicles as, the, uh, as one of the primary drivers of back injuries. And this, when we see video on TV, we typically see people getting out of armored vehicles, which are quite low to the ground. They get out from a ramp or a door, and they're, they're right on the ground. But in fact, uh, most of the time, at least uh, in the American military, most of the time that soldiers are transported, they're transported in a relatively high truck, and they typically get out of that truck by jumping out of it. Uh, in addition to themselves, they have quite a bit of uh, gear, which I think you all call kit. Uh, which adds substantially to their weight, and this, over time, produces repetitive trauma. So in this case, we were contacted, or contracted by the United States Army to look at this problem, and there was already empirical evidence supporting the fact that jumping out of vehicles hurts people. <laughs> not a shock. But the United States military, not unlike an oil and gas operator, has to take into account what is the overall cost to implement a solution. So if we put stairs on the back of each vehicle, does that in fact address the underlying cause? And is the cost of that in fact, uh, d does that, is that in fact um, reasonable given the cost of the, uh, the injuries that are occurring? In addition to that, if you talk to people in the military, and you tell them that you're going to weld a very safe, very nice set of stairs to the back of their truck, that's not necessarily something that they want. That cuts down the flexibility of the vehicle, and in fact, uh, if someone's shooting at you, getting out of the truck quickly becomes very, very important. So what seemed like a fairly trivial analysis to begin with actually turned into to quite a fascinating um, uh, engineering investigation. So we looked at, first, uh, the biometric impact of dismounting from the vehicle. We were able to measure uh, with the correct environmental conditions, with uniforms, with gear, with weapons, uh, exactly what does that do to the human body. And in fact, we validated the empirical data that in fact, yes, uh, some of the repetitive trauma injuries that, that the United States Army was seeing, that is consistent with the type of trauma you get jumping out of a vehicle carrying uh, 30 or 40 pounds of gear and a weapon. And in fact, uh, we were able to validate some of their estimates about the long-term uh, cost to the, the United States military from these, this repetitive trauma. So in fact, we did validate the need to do something. And then when we began to look at that something, what we were able to do was balance the need to get out of a vehicle quickly 
while at the same time reducing that repetitive trauma and strain. And so what we came up with was actually a, a folding stair design that allowed for very rapid dismount, but at the same time uh, minimized that, that impact. Here again, we got out of uh, opinion, we got into fact exactly how much impact uh, can the human body withstand over a given period of time, how do different conditions like low humidity, high heat environments, which believe it or not affects human joints quite a bit, uh, how, how do we balance those things and come up with uh, a very effective as well as cost-effective solution? Uh, next, we kind of went to the next level. So we took the human behavior model and we took the human anthropomorphic model and combined the two to look at survivability. And in this case, uh, the question that we were looking to address was uh, how to improve or ma really maximize crew combat effectiveness after a catastrophic uh, IED or improvised explosive device blast. Um, I, the, that there is such a thing as a catastrophic and a non-catastrophic IED was somewhat surprising to me. Uh, can you start the video, please? In fact, uh, they do categorize these things uh, this way. So the video that I'm going to show you, this has been approved for release, and what this actually shows, this is a simulation of a training exercise, which is a completely redundant thing to simulate, but it's something that we can show and distribute uh, freely without giving away any, uh, anything that we shouldn't. <coughs> we started by modeling the vehicle itself, and then we went in and modeled the ballistic effects of various types of IEDs on not only the vehicle itself, but the crew as well. We then went in and looked at, uh, again, human behavior, learning curve, the environment, um, uniforms, et cetera. And in this case, what we really had a focus on was uh, human dexterity, not just manual dexterity, but mental dexterity as well. So after, uh, a catastrophic blast, which in this case is going to be uh, simulated in the simulation by this vehicle being rolled upside down uh, in this cage, we were able to look and analyze, it, okay, now exactly after this event happens, exactly what are people really capable of. The engineering community had an idea about what soldiers would be capable of after being rolled upside down. The model, in fact, and of course the soldiers had their own opinion about what they were capable of, the model, in fact, allowed us to go in and take a look and say, okay, what is really reasonable here? So things like uh, the gymnastics move that the driver just did to get himself out from uh, behind the steering wheel looks fairly, uh, looks fairly complex. But in fact, all he really had to do was undo his seatbelt, and his weight dropped him on the ceiling. So he kind of naturally slid out of there. It really wasn't as, as dramatic as it might appear. But that, again, this is something that we were able to look at and model and say with, um, and put some mathematics behind exactly how effective are people in these types of situations. So far, we haven't applied the, uh, the deep kind of single human level analysis to the oil and gas industry. We've only worked at the system level, the interaction of large numbers of people. But certainly, uh, we see parallels and we see that it, it, it is in fact apropos for a number of, um, of different uh, environments and applications within oil and gas. So, uh, unfortunately, because of a couple other videos that didn't work, that's the end of my talk. I think when you get, um, well, two things really. You can look at the, you can go and you can begin to look at the extreme case. So under extreme environments, extreme situations, 
uh, procedure is written to do step one, step two, step three, step four. Is that, in fact, realistic to expect people in such an environment to be able to carry out step one, step two, step three, and step four? Not just from a physical point of view, but also uh, the, taking into account the mental aspect as well. That's, that's certainly one thing we can address, and I think the IED blast is, is an example of that. On the other hand, uh, we can also look at things like the repetitive, uh, the repetitive nature of operations. So if I do the same task every day, and I do that task 30 or 40 times a day, and after 30 or 40 times doing exactly the same task, after say 100 days, or that's kind of unrealistic, say 20 days on station, something goes wrong. With some degree of certainty, how likely am I to detect that? Or am I simply going through the motions here? And if I am, what's the lag time for me to realize that, in fact, I have a real problem here? This, this isn't like the 11 times I've already done this today, which are just like the 30 times I did it yesterday, which were like the 10 times I did it the day before. There is, in fact, something different going on here. And that, that's a type of analysis we do where we begin to look at uh, how is data reported to people? How do you, in fact, recognize that something's wrong. As you're going through your task, uh, of course, we'd all like to have a, a klaxon or a big red light that says trouble. But in fact, life is, tends to be a little more complicated than that. So how do you, uh, with an individual that we expect to do a, a repetitive task over and over again, how do you make the abnormal appear extraordinary? One of the things that struck me is it's obviously not something that's cheap to do. Um, and also, how do you justify? Because immediate reaction is this is fantastic, wonderful, but as we've heard before, the other side of the, the coin is always, well, how do I uh, balance the cost of doing it against the value of what I get out of it? What have you seen in this? Uh, we've seen, well, we've seen two things, actually. The um, the regulatory and the underwriter's view uh, of this technology is very, very positive. So I, I think what you'll begin to see is more of a requirement to do this type of analysis, which um, certainly doesn't address the cost, but maybe the impetus uh, to do it. With regard to the cost, we have our primary driver in business is efficiency. So for the most part, what we do are logistics simulations that, that improve overall efficiency, reduce overall operating cost. The safety benefit of that is, yes, there's a cost to do simulations specific to safety. But as a part of an overall initiative to reduce cost through efficiency by modeling processes and analysis, there is, in fact, the ability to, to recoup the cost to do this type of analysis as well. But I agree, it, it is a significant entry barrier. Please, yeah. David, just to carry on from your question, which is brought in from Link Associates, many of us here will have been in an offshore survival course and have been in the uh, helicopter um, evacuation escape in the swimming pool. Watching that simulation there, had I had an opportunity of watching something like that to show me what to do actually when releasing myself from the helicopter in the swimming pool with a number of people around me and having different seats in different locations, that I think would have probably given me a little bit more confidence about what I was doing when, I'm, um, when I was actually escaping. So that's an interesting one I think that the industry could take forward because we've had three or four helicopter incidents in the last two or three years. A couple of them actually landed quite safely, thank you, but one didn't, um, wasn't so successful. I think that could really enhance the safety aspect from that point of view. Yeah, I, I, I totally suppose that, I mean, my feeling having been in a helicopter is that you, you can end up with probably with a few people in the, in the, in the, uh, in the vehicle who knew what to do. And the rest of us were kind of dependent on it. Unfairly. Neil Dulling from Moltank. Um, I was just wondering if you'd used uh, the technology at all to uh, review the length of appointments and the time people are actually on a job, not specifically the, the, the daily task, but the, the period that they're appointed to a task. Um, obviously, we're in shipping, so 
we appoint people and then they go home on leave. I'm just wondering if the technology has ever been looked at to, f from an efficiency perspective, to see at what point we start seeing diminishing returns on, on, on the length of an appointment. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an excellent question. And in, to, to answer the question directly, no, we have not looked at, um, at really uh, job cycling going on and off, you know, going offshore, taking leave. Uh, that we haven't looked at specifically. I know there's quite a bit of empirical evidence and there's quite a bit of research being done um, around, at least in the United States, around children and school. And the, in the United States, we have a very significant summer break, which many people credit as a, as a major issue with the educational system. And from that has come a line of study which made its way into uh, job rotation in industrial settings that say things like 90 days is about the longest someone should be on a task uh, in a rotational job situation. At that point, it, there's a kind of a natural learning curve there where they, they crest. Uh, again, that's entirely empirical, and I don't, um, I don't know that there's any science to back that up aside from observation. Uh, but it, it's, it's something that we'd love to take a look at. It requires us to take a little bit longer view than what we've typically done with our models looking at uh, operations offshore, for example, but uh, but I think the technology certainly is there. It's just a case of, of the impetus to go and look at it. Uh, how long does it normally take you to uh, to develop the, the full scale model once you've once you've been given a project? Uh, the way I'm thinking of is <coughs> obviously within shipping at the moment. One of the, one of my big issues is piracy. Yep. And so obviously the Gulf of Aden and all that, and that's getting more and more developed now. It used to be small firearms, now it's RPGs. Mm -hmm. It's getting more violent, and obviously the the shipping industry is in its infancy. We're we we talk about building citadels, but we were talking about the guys on board build you know welding a couple of bars across across a, a door. Whereas what we look at to this is where it would have a where exactly would the impact if the RPG hit the side of the accommodation mm -hmm. at this tensile steel of this type of accommodation where all the safe areas and how you could pre pre prevent that sort of vast imp uh, you know improvisation going in so how long would that normally take for you to develop as a project uh. but that's an excellent question and actually when we started doing this analysis uh, originally back in 2006 that's exactly what we were looking at were uh, soldiers independently welding things onto their Humvees and other vehicles to protect themselves. And for the most part, what that creates is a bullet trap, which is a situation where the bullet on hitting the vehicle or the, the enclosure has enough energy to penetrate, but once it's inside, it doesn't have enough p energy to escape. So it rattles around in there, and it actually becomes a more lethal situation uh, when you start welding on armor to things uh, if, you, if you haven't done the upfront analysis to say, yes, in fact, this will stop the penetrator coming in in the first place. Uh, this, the simulation that you see here, this took us three calendar months from start to finish to produce the model. At that point, we had achieved a steady state where we could run any scenario that our client asked us to. We're not the experts in vehicle design or armor design. What we do is we create uh, the model that allows the people who are experts to test various armor designs against various different types of munitions. So in about three calendar months, we could put you in a position where you could say, okay, what about this armor package? What about this armor package? What about this armor package? And we could begin to look at the survivability trade-off versus what's the effect of adding uh, the weight, for example, to the platform that you're talking about. Because, of course, there is... Um, if it were, if there was no impediment to armoring ourselves to the maximum, we would do it, of course. Uh, but there's cost trade-offs, there are trade-offs in efficiency and mobility and these types of things. So in about three calendar months, we could put you in a position where you could begin to make those types of trade-offs. The simulation that you saw of the platform where you had a number of people running around, that took about nine calendar months to pull together. And the majority of that time was actually comparing uh, the written procedure versus what was actually happening on the platform. So we ended up, we actually ended up with two models. We ended up with the, the model of platform operations uh, as is and the model of platform operations as was intended. And the two were, 
they weren't that far off. It, it wasn't the case that you had total chaos happening on this platform. But you had some significant variation that resulted in major differences in an evacuation <coughs> scenario. And, and those are the kinds of things I think, uh, I have, actually have a naval background um, before getting into uh, joining the circus and getting into software. Um, in, a, in a naval environment, we updated our war fighting procedures all the time based on changes in threat, changes in um, it, where we were sailing or, or what was happening. But we didn't go back and do such a great job of updating damage control to reflect the changes that we'd made in, in uh, the procedure changes, procedural changes that we'd made to war fighting. And I think that is, that was really kind of reflected in the analysis that we did on the platform where we went back and said, okay, what are people actually, what are people supposed to be doing? What are they actually doing? The, the emergency procedures were written for what they were supposed to be doing. What they're actually doing isn't necessarily wrong or bad. It's just different. And now what, how does that different, uh, how does what's actually happening interplay differently with, with what the procedure was? So in that case, it took us a little bit longer. And I, I can't tell you, we haven't done enough of these for me to come back and say nine months is a rule of thumb or were these guys particularly messy or, or were they in fact uh, abnormally close to their written procedure? I, I don't know. Thank you. Um, data. Uh, you got a model. You need good data. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that the commission found when it was trying to cast forward, because uh, you shouldn't look back from an incident. You should look to see what the incident teaches you about the future. Otherwise, you're just preventing the last accident, aren't you? Which has already happened. Um, but it's quite. This is not a particularly transparent industry. The uh, mm -hmm. the oil and gas sector. Um, that's what it is. Uh, and so what problems do you envisage, have you encountered, about actually getting your hands on the kind of data um, that uh, actually helps you um, provide the undoubtedly high potential service that you would like to be offering? Our, uh, our modeling technique is actually relatively data, uh, is relatively not data intensive. If you look at something like, within the oil and gas industry, uh, there's a lot of focus certainly on reservoir simulation, for example. And um, you know, the refinery industry is a great example. They do a lot of simulation there. That's all uh, a type of heuristic analysis that's based on data, historical data. What we're doing is, um, without getting too deep into the simulation technology, we're doing a type of simulation that's known as stochastic or discrete event simulation. And that's actually based on uh, tasks, behaviors, it's action driven. So if, if we have the procedures, if we know what people are doing or supposed to be doing, we don't need an exhaustive history of data in terms of what, what has actually happened on that platform. So what we typically end up doing is we, we create a model that's based again from the bottom up we run uh, sort of a nominal set of data through this thing, and that allows our client to go back and look at, okay, given these inputs, here are the outputs that you would typically see. Run some of your own base data through this thing. Uh, validate it and prove to yourself or come back and say to us, hey, we don't think this is behaving correctly and this is why, and we'll make the appropriate changes. So the, the validation step typically gets done by the client, and we very often uh, we don't, we're not working with actuals. They're looking at the actuals, comparing the results of the model and saying, yes, in fact, this does line up. Uh, one more, please. Uh, John Hover from Pronita. Um, in, in the industry upstream on platforms, we do have quite a serious problem that we rely on um, working level guys up to where I am and captain level making decisions about their their jobs which can have very serious consequences for instance the decision not to close a VOP quickly can mean that you blow the whole thing to bits on a lower level if you drop a spanner down the hole and don't tell anyone that 
can have very severe consequences too. And we find it very hard to educate people, to show them how serious the consequences can be of not telling someone you've got the spanner or of damaging a line and not telling anyone or not reacting quickly to a situation for which there is no other solution. And Macondo has taught us that. And I wonder whether um, you've yet got any interest from the super majors in um, simulating a disaster to show with all the, um, uh, the great impact that video games have, mm -hmm. the consequence of you w hitting that button at 31 seconds rather than 30 seconds. The consequence at 31 seconds is very dramatic. To try and get, to try and, uh, because these people will never have seen that impact before. They'll never have seen a disaster before. They've probably never seen a BOP close before. And, and I'm just th thinking that the video game uh, presentation could be a very powerful uh, teaching method to get us past what appears to be an insoluble problem at the moment. Uh, there, is, there is, in fact, another side to our business. Uh, we, we started out with simulation and have kind of slowly moved over to also do uh, a number of visualization activities, primarily for training. And in that case, um, when you get into things like recognition of, of what's wrong, uh, when you have a repetitive task, for example, uh, very often people aren't entirely sure what does correct look like. So we, we actually spend quite a bit of time visualizing, okay, this is, this is what the situation should look like. If it deviates in this way or this way or this way, you in fact have a problem. Uh, when it comes to showing the results of, of uh, doing something wrong, that's not something that we've specifically looked at in the past. But I think what you're saying does in fact carry quite a bit of, uh, there's quite a bit of validity to that. If you look at the generational shift that's occurring in a number of industries, including energy, uh, you have people entering the workforce who have spent, uh, you know, they live in a, a visual environment and with visual media. And that's the, the idea that, that you sit down and you read a 400 page book and it says things like, don't do this or it's bad, that, that just doesn't have the same impact uh, with that demographic that, as you say, seeing, okay, if you do this, this is what happens. Uh, the issue, of course, that you run into then is how do you model all of the different ways you can fail? And, and that becomes a bit of a challenge. In the simulation environment, what we're able to do is come back with um, a number of, with confidence intervals and with sensitivity analysis and say, so we can come back and say, okay, this particular process, this particular piece of equipment, this particular job function is very, very sensitive. If it's done incorrectly, it has a cascading effect throughout the entire operation or the entire platform and is very detrimental to operating efficiency or safety or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is at least something that the leadership can take and say, okay, I know I need to pay attention to this, and I know that this task needs to be done correctly. And if I'm going to do things like job rotation, and that's one of the job functions I'm gonna rotate, I need to be very, very careful how I do that, because any variability there has a cascading effect that ripples through the rest of the operation. Okay, very good. Thank you for All that, right. Steve. Thank you.